Well, we'll go ahead and start our second panel. I will, um, it's an honor to be able to introduce LaTanya Autry um, as our moderator for this second panel, Trauma and Memory. And I have had the privilege of knowing LaTanya, um, met her uh, while she was a fellow at the Yale University Art Gallery, um, where I got to know her uh, brilliant skills in curating. Um, but also her deep commitment to the role that museums can play um, in, in our moment in responding to what happens out in the world and the way that we have an obligation as educators and as curators and as museum staff um, to engage with that work. So it's a real privilege to have you here um, at the Mississippi Museum of Art as the first curator of art and civil rights. And, um, You've already done a tremendous job. So you're the perfect person to moderate um, this second <coughs> panel. Her um, scholarship and dissertation work focuses on lynching memorials. Um, and of course, trauma and memory are, are very much part of, of, of that <coughs> scholarship. So Latanya, I will turn it over to you who will introduce the rest of the panelists. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, Wow, thanks to all of you for being here for this discussion. I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna have a very rich um, dialogue with these wonderful speakers. I am honored actually to be here with three panelists that I um, esteem so much. Um, professor Robbie Luckett is from Jackson State University. He is a professor there and probably many of you do know him. Um, I came to know um, Robbie, I'll, Robbie, is that all right? Fine, I came to know Robbie um, last spring when I came here for the interview and was very impressed with his work. Um, he told me about a civil rights photographer. That he's, he's turned me on to all kind of important kind of scholarship that's happening here. Um, he actually got his degree, his BA at Yale University and his PhD from University of Georgia. He's a native Mississippian. He kind of came back here. Um, he is the director of the Margaret Walker Center. He is also on the board for the um, Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. He's involved in just so many things here in Jackson. I could go on and on. One of the things I wanted to say is some of you might have seen him in, um, he was in some films, uh, Spies of Mississippi, as well as An Ordinary Hero. So very involved with um, these issues of civil rights and um, these important histories of trauma. Um, Nona Faustine is someone that I've been following her work for years, and I finally got a chance to meet her last year when I was She is just, I mean, I've always been blown away with her photography. Uh, the first time I came across it was probably, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago from a hyperallergic um, article. And uh, once you see her work, you, you can't ever forget it. She, just, she does this really important work where she's highlighting histories of slavery in New York City. Um, many people you know, like to think that slavery has nothing to do with areas like New York and in the North. Um, Nona is out there really making a difference in exposing those histories and kind of forcing us to um, deal with these things. She got her degree at School of Visual Arts um, and the International Center of Photography. Um, their MFA program, <laughs> excuse me. Um, she has a really important series of work called White Shoes, My Country, and the Mitochondria series. Um, lots of fabulous stuff about Nona. Her work is in permanent collections of the Studio Museum in Harlem, the David Driscoll Center at Maryland State, and most recently the Brooklyn Museum of Art actually purchased some of her work as well. They were very smart to do so. Um, also, we have uh, Professor Dell Upton here. Another person that I've admired for a number of years since I started my graduate studies at University of Delaware. His name was repeated over and over by the head of our department about uh, Mr. Del, Del Upton, Dr. Del Upton. He's an architectural historian. He's the chair of the Department of Art History at UCLA. He's written all kind of great stuff, including this book, which everybody should read, What Can and um, Can't Be Said, Race, Uplift, and Monument Building in the Contemporary South. And he has um, written quite a bit about Confederate monuments and this kind of history of um, history and heritage, these arguments that are kind of out there. So I definitely felt for this panel, he was the very important person to have on our, um, be part of this discussion with us today. 
and many more things we can say about all of them, but I actually think we should try to jump into our conversation because I think this is going to be very rich. We're going to speak for a bit, and then, of course, we're going to invite you to be part of this as well. So I guess the first thing I wanted to say is, you know, we've all been, I think all of us have been kind of working in this realm for years, um, some of you many more years than myself. Um, but I think a lot of times for the public, some people haven't really been thinking about um, these kind of issues about what monuments really mean until more recently with things that have occurred in our country and in the uh, news, especially of last year, last summer, I think, when things were going on in um, Charlotte, Charlottesville. Um, can we talk about this? Like when people say, well, you know, there's been all, there was this rush, what happened, and, and there was this, the, the march or whatever, this kind of protest that was happening by white supremacists, and it ended up where someone lost their life. You know, a, a car rolled into a group of people and someone lost her life at this. And um, then there was this kind of surge across the nation of attention thinking, well, we, we really should get rid of these monuments. And we saw this happen a little bit before with what happened in um, South Carolina, um, we've seen a tension where people started to think we should, you know, remove the Confederate flag, these kind of symbols of um, this past history of racism in our country, um, and I would say continuing histories or legacies of, of racism. People want to remove these things, but we see a push where people say, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't take these away because we would be erasing history, that censorship, all, all of these kind of things. I'm just going to throw that out out there to any of you if you want to kind of jump in here. What do you think about this discussion that's happening? And what's, what's good about it? What's, what's problematic? I'll defer to my friends here. Well, jump in. Everybody's looking jump in, at Nona. me. All right. Um, well, first of all, when you, when you talked about the car that rolled it, and it wasn't rolled in, it was used as a weapon. So right. that's, let's get that, that straight. Um, you know, when I began the ser my series, White Shoes, it was about uh, one of the things is the lack of tribute or monuments or anything to the people who built New York City. And, you know, are coming from, you know, born and raised in, in Brooklyn, you know, that was my immediate reference and, and concern. And it, it was something where you know, to me, finding out how enslaved people p played such a huge role in the city, you know, and its history and the big, you know, it's a, it's a big, um, its role in, in the country and, and the world, New York City. And so there was this lack of awareness and I, I, I felt like using, the only way that I could kind of rectify that is to use my body literally to mark these sites where enslaved people lived, died, and were buried. And, you know, it, it was the only thing I had, you know. Um, and so when you talk about um, just a large, just how all over the, the country there are these Confederate statues to this history, but then there is none for you know enslaved people and African Americans. You know, I I, I kind of I feel like I really I, I want to see them go. To me, I, I you know people say, well, you know, should we be taking these statues down um, and erasing history? I don't see it that way. I, I see these monuments kind of like endorsements. To, to racism and, and prejudice. And I think keeping them um, up sort of like endorses that. And um, I think if we wanna heal and we wanna go forward as a nation, I think we have to rectify um, some of, some of these, these monuments. And you know, they're, they're potent symbols and I think what we saw in Charlottesville was, was that. Um, anytime you feel like you have to use violence to, to um, protect or endorse these, these symbols of hate, um, I think that 
yeah, we're, we're on the wrong course. <laughs> and if they're that, you know, potent to racist, then I think we should just take them down. If we want to go forward as a country, you know, um, and rectify the wrongs that have been done over centuries, I think, I think that's a perfect place to start. I know, um, P Professor Upton, you've written specifically about these issues of this argument about erasure. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'd, I think there are two things uh, to keep in mind. The first is this question of monuments as history. Monuments are not history. History is a long and complicated set of human events that we choose to tell in certain ways. Monuments commemorate some parts of history we choose to, re to commemorate. Um, the, the, uh, so that by removing Confederate monuments, you're certainly not erasing the Confederates from American history. You have to talk about them. But you are saying, and this is the, the second point, is that is the nature of civic space. Um, civic space as it has evolved in America, in, in the United States, is a space in which uh, the country, the locality, ostensibly expresses its higher, its highest values. And of course, there, that's always imperfect. But to retain these monuments in civic space, uh, which as Nona says, are um, monuments to white supremacy, uh, is to say that that's our highest value. And it's to say that we, we endorse uh, the exclusion of a major part of our population from our civic space. Uh, it's important to, to recognize that these monuments are only ostensibly about the Confederacy. They're primarily a creation of the New South period, uh, which was an era in which Southerners, certain Southerners, white Southerners, attempted to create a modern, industrialized, urbanized economy, but one that was based upon uh, essentially recasting slavery. Uh, finding a place for, for African Americans in this modern, industrialized, urbanized economy that was equivalent to their place uh, in slavery, even though they weren't legally enslaved. So these, are, these monuments say something about an entire view of the South, uh, and in my opinion, the period from 1880 to 1920 is the key period in Southern history for understanding what uh, the South is all about. These monuments are a, a, a monuments to a vision of a Southern society that I think uh, is no longer appropriate uh, to be expressed in public space. People say, well, what about, some of these monuments are beautiful. Some are beautiful. Some are aesthetically pleasing. Many of them are mass produced. Uh, so my argument is the aesthetically pleasing ones should be in art, in, in art museums. Art museums are full of beautiful images of nasty people. Uh, <laughs> Medici's and Borgias and so on. That's the place for ones that might have some aesthetic value. Civic space is not the place for any um, Confederate monuments, and I agree with Nona that they should all go. I don't believe uh, that it will happen quickly, but I believe that that's uh, what should happen with them. Here, here. I couldn't agree more. Um, I um, would say that I think it's particularly important while we're here in Jackson and Mississippi that we understand the specific context of Mississippi in this role and in the creation of these monuments. And I agree completely with Dell that understanding the context of 1890 and this rise of the quote unquote New South um, is particularly important for all of us here. Uh, let's understand, Mississippi played an absolutely central role in inventing Jim Crow. We invented it, by and large, through the Constitution of 1890. That Constitution which those of us who live in Mississippi still live under to this day. A Constitution that was created for one purpose, to disfranchise African Americans. That was it. To disfranchise African Americans, and if you could disfranchise African Americans, you could control all of the other elements of power. You could control, obviously, political power, but also social power and economic power, power that African Americans in Mississippi were wielding in really incredible ways in the aftermath of the Civil War and emancipation. They were reestablishing and establishing families, building communities and schools and businesses. They were running for political office. I think it's 
pretty remarkable that we had two black United States senators from Mississippi during Reconstruction in the 1870s, Howard Rebels and Blanche K. Bruce. When Barack Obama was elected to the United States Senate, he was the fifth black U.S. senator in American history. We had two from Mississippi in the 1870s. And so the ability to control the right to vote in particular and undermining the 15th Amendment and the Constitution of 1890 was absolutely essential in this story. And the thing was the 15th Amendment wrote a loophole into it. Uh, it said that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. White Mississippians realized in 1890 that if it couldn't be denied or abridged based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude, there are other ways it could be not denied or abridged. Literacy exams. In Mississippi, we had what was called the Interpretation Clause. You had to interpret the state constitution to the satisfaction of a voting registrar. There were black folks with PhDs who couldn't interpret it to the satisfaction of white voting registrars. Uh, poll taxes. In Mississippi, it was a $2 poll tax, but you had to pay $2 for every year that you had lived where you were in order to vote. So if you had paid, if you had lived someplace for five years and went to register to vote, you didn't have to just pay a $2 poll tax, you had to pay a $10 poll tax when you went to vote. Residency requirements, property requirements, all of which would be held up by the United States Supreme Court in 1898 in a, in a case called Williams v. Mississippi. A case that after it was enacted, allowed every southern state to enact black disfranchisement. Every southern state that had been a part of the Confederacy rewrote their state constitutions to reflect what they called the Mississippi Plan. They imitated us. And in taking away the right to vote, they took away the ability for African Americans to impact all other aspects of their social lives. If you don't have the right to vote, if you cannot elect people to represent you, you can't do anything about the fraud of disfranchisement. You can't do anything about the fraud of segregation and social power. You can't do anything about the fraud of sharecropping and convict lease, where we would literally arrest people and lease them to landowners so that they would have to work the same land they and their parents and grandparents had worked as slaves. You can't do anything about the atrocity of lynching. I think one of the most shocking statistics, and I'm deeply grateful for the work of the Equal Justice, Initi uh, Equal Justice Initiative uh, in Montgomery and the uh, lynching memorial that will be established there in April, I believe it's right. opening. In Mississippi, between 1877 and 1950, according to the EJI statistics, there were 654 known lynchings. That was a known lynching every six weeks for 73 years in the state of Mississippi. A known lynching every six weeks for 73 years. You can't do anything about that if you don't have the right to vote, if you can't serve on a jury, because jury rolls are pulled for voter registration rolls. If you can't elect a sheriff, and if you control all of that power, you also can control how the past is remembered. And it's also in that context that all of these monuments are created throughout the South. It is in that context of the invention of Jim Crow that we get probably the most significant symbol of white supremacy in the state of Mississippi, our current state flag, erected in 1894, four years after the Constitution of 1890 for one simple reason, to represent that past and that history. And it is in that context that Mississippi in particular plays a central role in the erection of all these monuments and memorials and why I couldn't agree more with my friends here. And these monuments also are in New York State and throughout they're, New they're York. They're all over, right? Yeah, they're in yeah. Ohio, they're in Montana. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't those places that were not part of the Confederacy, but yet they yeah. have these monuments. Right? But uh, I, I was speaking to someone not earlier about how invested, heavily invested New York State was in New York City um, in slavery. And we were so heavily invested that we almost didn't fight on the Union side. We almost for, for the Confederates because New York made so much money during slavery and trading with southern states. Um, we bought your cotton, we manufactured it into something called slave cloth um, that outfitted the slaves. And so um, we made a lot of money and, and you know, enslavers um, brought, you know, vacationed in New York City and brought their slaves to New York. So we were like, there we, our hands are just as dirty, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, Nona was in New Haven uh, last summer and I had given some walking tours of 
um, New Haven and was highlighting yeah. the activism, black activism that has happened there really from, I guess, 18 or 19, 18th century till to today, really, um, in New Haven. And we walked around and, and looked at the city. And I thought it was so important to do that because, like you said, with, about New York, but the same thing with um, Connecticut. Connecticut yeah. people, people who live in these places in Connecticut, a, a lot of times will think that, you know, that has nothing to do with them. Slavery is not at all part of right. that history, which is absurd, of course, especially, um, you know, I was working at Yale, and uh, uh, Yale has pretty much founded on um, money from slave trading. Yeah. So all, all the Ivy League colleges Absolutely. Right. are founded on slave, slave money and had slaves that built the, many of the buildings and schools and uh, Rutgers University. Mm -hmm. I was just there um, this year doing a project with them, and and they wrote a book actually on how slavery shaped and and um, the school profited mm -hmm. from slavery. So, yeah, we are seeing kind of a tide with some universities kind of coming out and yeah. it, like putting that on the table. Um, what was this? Is it George Mason University in Washington? Yeah. Um, I mean, so many schools really so kind of sold, sold, actually sold people so that they could have to keep um, the school George going. Yeah. Yes, right. records as well. Right. Was one of those schools. I, I went to graduate school at Brown, which uh, was is named after the Brown family, who were who were major um, slave traders, and Brown was one of the first universities to try to to. Uh, excavate and and um, tell this history but it's interesting that that uh, it always has been a kind of part of this the psyche of Providence uh, <laughs> there were stories when I was there long before this happened that uh, under College Hill where where Brown was there were tunnels uh, in which you could still find shackles and that slaves had been hidden there uh, when when they were imported by the Browns that uh, the fallacy of that, besides being that that um, uh, there are no such tunnels, is that there was no need to hide uh, this trade uh, at the time the Browns were were practicing. But it is a kind of uh, kind of interesting sort of uh, what would we say Freudian kind of right. uh, mythology. Hmm. So I'm interested in. Um you know, in Mississippi, I think so in, in the other places, they haven't really often, people have not actually engaged these histories and in deep ways and only more recently are starting to. I think in Mississippi, um, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say people have been trying to um, engage this in a very deep way, but it's been more obvious, I think, from, from the get-go about the, comp the complexities, yeah. right? It's, it's obvious, it's out there. Um, one of these things that I find interesting is um, Professor Upton, you had this theory you talk about a dual heritage in the South. You know, there's a lot of discussion about history versus heritage and people saying, you know, this is my, this is my heritage and that's why we, we want these memorials to stay or these monuments. Um, and, and yet there are certain approaches that cities have taken where um, they're using what I would call racial uplift to uh, make monuments to certain African-American leaders. And so the Confederate monuments still are out there while at the same time that there's these other forms. And I mean, we can see that here in Jackson with the Civil Rights Museum, and yet our state flag still contains a Confederate emblem. I mean, i just putting that out there to really all of you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, obviously the state of Mississippi has been as complicit and intentional about maintaining white supremacy as any state in the nation. I do think the points that were being made here that are really important for us to understand that the South has tended to be exceptionalized in our memory of America, but America is complicit in this history. The entire nation is. As far as this notion of heritage goes, one of the things that I always like to remark on is this notion somehow that our heritage is always supposed to be positive. I don't know who wrote that rule. Like, I mean, none of us can do anything about our heritage. Like, our heritage is our heritage. I can't help who my ancestors were, but I can be honest about that past. I can be honest about that history. And I think that's particularly important for us to realize. Our heritage doesn't always have to be something that we celebrate as having been perfect. Well, um, some of you may have seen that uh, in the past week, Savannah, has decided to alter its Confederate monument by listing the names of soldiers on both sides who died in the Civil War. Um, that's a good example of this idea of dual heritage that really has, has uh, arisen since the 1950s and 60s as a way to 
uh, acknowledge African American heritage without having to make any significant adjustments to the understanding of Confederate heritage. So Confederate heritage and African American heritage are somehow parallel. They're equally honorable. They have nothing to do with one another. Um, the fact that, that um, civil, the civil rights movement in particular uh, is directly uh, opposed to the heritage of the Confederacy is something that's, that's, that's not discussed and it, it has become a way of, of uh, evading these issues. And I think what perhaps has happened since, uh, since the shootings in Charleston, since the uh, events in Char Charlottesville last summer is that it's becoming harder to maintain that, uh, that separation, that eventually uh, a public history of the South will have to be written that is not uh, written as two separate strains. I, I used to do, in the 90s, I used to do a series of uh, summer workshops for public school teachers in the South. Uh, it was fun funded by the Agriculture Department. It's called the, the National Faculty. Um, so these were people who taught in public schools, which meant that their students were primarily African American. The teachers were about half black and half white. Uh, at one point, uh, we were in New Orleans and we took them to a, a, a plantation called Destrahead, which was designed and built by a free black carpenter, uh, but was a big sugar plantation. And uh, whenever the guide, uh, had to say something about African Americans, she'd turn to the black teachers and say, now here's something you'll be interested in. <laughs> uh, and it, it, to, to me, that, that really epitomizes that kind of, kind of attitude. And as long as you see these histories as separate, and as long as you see them as, as equal, mm -hmm. then uh, you'll have these, these problems. And I think they'll keep, they'll keep coming up. This, Charlottesville has kind of been replaced by Me Too. Uh, but eventually something else will happen and it will come up again and it will come up again and it will come up again. Even, even in New York, um, recently they uh, had a, like a, formed a committee and a panel mm -hmm. to go over all the monuments that were are deemed uh, troublesome or racist and, um, you know, even Christopher Columbus statue at 59 Columbus Circle was up and that to me was the big one even though it's it's you know before all of this um, it still was to me the uh, made a major statue that I felt needed to be taken down but in the end um, they decided to keep it up and one they of kept pretty much everything they're only moving one and moving it to just another location right, right? Uh, Marion J right. Sims the gynecologist who who did um, he was the father of gynecology and performed um, experiments on enslaved women. Um, horrible, anesthesia. horrible yeah. experiments. Yeah. Um, but his statue is being moved. But yeah, one of the reasons why is it that the Columbus statue was allowed to stay is, is because we have a large Italian community and their pride in Columbus being the one who discovered America, um, you know, they they had the say in that, or, or a part certain, of a say certain in that. political clout, yeah, right? Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, well, uh, the, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I'm finished. No, that's an that's an interesting issue because it, it's another issue that arises in the period we're talking about in the early 20th century. Joe Ciora, who is a uh, folklorist of Italian America, has pointed out that until the early 20th century. Italian Americans uh, had no interest at all in Columbus. Uh, that the the exaltation of Columbus was really a way for Italians to counter uh, anti-Italian immig immigration sentiment. Uh, in the early 20th century, people uh, nativists would say, "Well, uh, Italians or Slavs or or the Chinese, they have great cultures, but they didn't send us their best people." Uh, we've, we've heard that recently, but they've said the same thing. Uh, and so uh, the early 20th century immigrants tried to claim uh, figures that they thought represented uh, the, their high culture, and this is when Columbus becomes uh, an, an icon to Italian Americans. I, I want to highlight something as um, Nona's work is actually quite different in many ways. Um, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about these monuments and, and the flags, 
But um, like you said, you st as you started out, where you're actually putting your own body on the line. I mean, you're going in these spaces. Like, what really arrested my attention is when I first saw her work was a photograph of her in at Wall Street, standing on this crate in the middle of Wall Street. And you made such a statement by putting your body out there, and it was highlighting that that was a center of um, slave trading, that a kind of auction site. So I kind of actually want to um, kind of ask you this, Nona, and, and as well as um, Robbie and Dell, um, about the, the visual arts. So, you know, we can get in a long conversation actually about these monuments as art forms, and we kind of touched on that a little bit. But, you know, your practice is particular about you doing this as an individual artist. I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. And maybe, um, like at Wall Street right now, there's a marker, right, that's been placed there, but there's, there's nothing else? I, I mean, think. there's... There's very few sites in New York City that actually are marked in consistency with the depth of, of enslaved mm -hmm. people living and building the city. Um, we do have the, the, the burial African ground. Burial Ground Monument Center. So I don't know if you, you guys know this, but in Lower Manhattan, um, there's a African burial ground monument. And in the 90s, they were about to um, build a federal tower on, <coughs> off of Chamber Street. And whenever you build anything in New York City, because it's one of the oldest cities in the, in the uh, country, you have to go to the archives. So they went to the archives, and they saw that the, the map said the burial ground, African burial ground. So it was, on the, it was on the maps, but they still decided to go ahead and dig. And of course, they hit the cemetery. And it was about 25 feet under landfill. So it was outside of what was originally the city limits. Um, and w they, they underestimated how the city would react to this news that in the middle of Manhattan, there was like a cemetery of like all these African people who, you know, and, and, and we, in school, were taught that we had freed our slaves early, and there was little or no slavery here, and so, you know, you could be proud as a New Yorker. And when they found the cemetery, it was like, whoa. And people just went, the city exploded. And so they scaled back. It was all these protests, yada, yada, and they scaled back how big the, the building would be. Um, but still, it was, today 15 to 20,000 um, by best estimates of enslaved people under the streets of Manhattan and, um, adjacent to where all our municipal buildings and courts and it are literally the foundation mm -hmm. of our government. Um, and so I remember as um, a kid this whole thing, and it had a deep and profound impact mm -hmm. upon me. And so when it came time to, uh, I was in the MFA program, it was a very challenging and rigorous program, um, and what was I gonna do for my thesis? And I, at the same time, was in a program that I found myself, I hit up against this really wall, wall of prejudice. Um, and at that same time, Barack Obama was, you know, a president, and we were realizing his presidency wasn't bringing about all this kind of utopia that we thought we, you know, healing and everything. And I think those three things, the history of New York, the president, my place in the city, as the city um, is being, our neighborhoods are being gentrified, cities that, I mean, neighborhoods that African Americans have built for hundreds of years are people just being <laughs> displaced. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, it, and it's kind of violence when you do that. Um, and so it was about remembrance, it was about my place in the city, would I be remembered? Would, you know, would my family be remembered, my neighbors? Um, and so it was like this kind of sorrow, pain, um, knowing that the history of New York City and that we actually took all means to cover up mm -hmm. 
slavery. I mean, when you put 25 feet of landfill on top of a cemetery, that's, that's monumental. That's saying a lot. That's desecration. Um, and then you have a number of cemeteries like Trinity Church and uh, the Dutch Reformed Church um, in my neighborhood that is preserved. Um, and then you have, well, where, where are the African Americans? Like, I, I've asked historians, um, okay, if New York City, or Brooklyn rather, was one of the largest slave holding boroughs, where are the cemeteries to all those people? And what many of us are coming to the conclusion is that they're the foundation of our buildings. Mm -hmm. They built the city literally on top of many uh, black, bodies, black right? yeah, yeah. So that was what, that was what um, pushed me to, to make the work. And even today in New York City, there's, there's a marker for David Ruggles, who was the abolitionist, who helped free, who helped freed Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. His is on Les Bernard Street. The building, um, uh, the part of the Underground Railroad is still there. Um, Wall Street, the slave market, but it's not where the slave market actually was. The 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 plaque that commemorates that it's a ways off. off You'd have side. to go look yeah. for it. That's what I so it's it's a few like markers here and there, and then you have the Harriet Tubman statue in Harlem. So you can literally almost count on your hands, like right. well, the the contribution, you know. And then you have the the African burial ground monument. So your work is so important for helping to bring more attention to this. Um, you know, the history, also of course the artistic um, merit of it. And I guess I just want to ask, like, what you know, to to you to you all, and probably for all of us, but what can we do as public historians? Um, you know, individually, I know Nona, you're putting your, you're literally putting your body on the line. Um, suggestions, what, and I know it's, it's, it's a problem too for people in public history. It's, it's a area that um, in some ways I don't feel like this should be anything new, but it, it seems to be com conflict in different areas, sometimes with the National Park Service. Um, it, and things have changed from the early 2000s to now, but even there were some problems there sometimes about talking about slavery. Um, you know, as professors in, in classrooms or as high school teachers, um, as just citizens, you know, what, what can we do about these monuments? I'd suggest we can do exactly what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Have these conversations in public. Have these conversations in Mississippi. There are people in this audience that I see who know for a fact, because they put their lives on the line, that 50 years ago, we wouldn't have been having this conversation in downtown Jackson. We would have all been risking our lives to even gather together in a group as integrated as this, right? Uh, the Sovereignty Commission would have been outside writing down our license plate tags, following us. We would have likely have seen mob violence just to have this conversation. The fact that we can do this in the public and be honest and open about it is a powerful testimony to the activists who are here and the people who fought to help us to begin changing this narrative. And the good news is we can change it. We look at something like the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. If you haven't been there, um, you need to make um, a trip. You need to uh, make a time to spend several hours there. The opportunity to build that kind of monument, and I consider the Civil Rights Museum to be a monument, that kind of monument that's going to be here that does explicitly does truth telling and as it was developed as there were community meetings around this state the central theme that communities particularly our black communities in mississippi wanted to see happen was they wanted the truth to be told and for us to be able to engage those conversations and to engage the work of people like nona uh, and to engage this history in public ways and have these public conversations we can begin to change the narrative and i think that's absolutely essential and the fact that we're doing it in mississippi we got a long ways to go, That's, there's no doubt about that. Any of us who are paying attention to what's going on in our state legislature while they're in session right now understands we still got a lot of work to do. But we're moving forward. Um, well, thank you to all of you. Did you want to add something? Uh, other than to agree, but also to say um, that voting 
is still important, and Mississippi is a, mm. a great example of that. Um, voting rights are still important, the assault on voting rights. Um, I taught, 10 years ago, I taught for a little while at the University of Virginia, and uh, I had Julian Bond as a, as a, um, a colleague, and I heard him say in a talk uh, that in Southside Virginia, which is this uh, uh, tier of counties that runs south of the James and was big, uh, the big tobacco area in Virginia, that still then in 2005, no more African Americans were registered to vote than had been in the 1960s. Um, and that's why they send the kind of people they do to Congress and to the state legislature. Uh, so monuments are important in the sense that they do uh, express some sort of civic ideals but simply taking down the Confederate monuments, uh, while I think it's important, is not going to solve underlying issues. And, and so what, as, as public historians, to answer Latanya's question, I think that what we need to do is to try as best we can to explain the connection between those monuments and the underlying structures that, that they represent. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from all of you. I don't know if somebody's passing out a microphone if we're doing it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hi, we had a whole bunch of questions in this area. Thank you so much for a really interesting panel discussion. Nona, I'd love to ask you a question, uh, a couple of questions about your work. First of all, do you consider the photographs to be the primary um, remains from your work, or do you have videos as well? And also, what kind of reaction uh, did you receive at the time uh, from people who were passing by and didn't have perhaps a sense at all of what you were doing? Um, I feel that um, the photographs are a, a document of, of me being at those sites. I don't like to shoot video when it, because in New York City, um, it's illegal to be nude in public. And so when I go to these sites, um, I'm working rather quickly uh, to avoid <laughs> um, interactions with New York City police. And, but a lot of it also began for my own mental healing and to pay tribute to the ancestors. My ancestors, our ancestors. Um, and so, you know, when I go out there, the adrenaline's pumping, but it, it's something that I had to do. Like, I mean, it wouldn't, that once I conceived of the idea, it wouldn't go away. It would literally would not go away. And I, I told my mom that I was gonna do this, and she was like, I wouldn't do that if I was you. Like, every, <laughs> no one wanted me to do that. Even my, the, the executive director of the MFA program, when I, I had to tell what my thesis was, and he was like, do you understand what that means when you go out in public and you take your clothes off and let's say you're accosted by the police or the interactive with them, do you understand how they see that as civil disobedience? And I was like, okay, uh, I yeah, I know, but I, I just have to do it. So, you know, um, it, it really is, is about more than just um, the spectacle and titillation. It's, it's my own personal way of acknowledging that history. Um, and to answer your other, what was the other part of your question? Uh, I can't remember what my other part was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The reaction. Oh, um, it ranges. Um, <laughs> mostly, it's early in the morning, usually. The city is quieter. Uh, in the mornings, on the weekends. But when I do, uh, people do see me, they're kind of stunned. <laughs> but they, they, in New York, it's weird. It, people just let you do what you need to do. <laughs> I mean, 
I, I think it's because we, it's a city that is, is used to movies being filmed, photo shoots, you know, pe you know, trucks come into my neighborhood, they take up the whole block, you're filming, okay. I, I was riding my bike the other day down the street and they were filming a movie in my neighborhood and, and you know, they shouted out, oh, someone's coming on their bike and they just let me go through and I mean, oh, okay. So it's like normal kind of thing, but the one place that I did um, get a, a big, rea well, kind of not a reaction was, was the Wall Street site and it was in the middle of the intersection of the street. And at one point I got, you know, stuck. The lights changed and the cars literally just drove past me and I couldn't believe that they weren't stopping for a naked big black lady in the middle of the street. They just literally kept driving past me and I was like, like, don't you see me here? And they were like, no, 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 we don't, you know? <laughs> So that was one. Um, there was, and then, and then usually, sometimes I'm so focused that I don't see people. But my sister, who helps me, said she sees them, and she was like, "Yeah, that man just—he stopped, he looked, and kept on going." You know, <laughs> so it's that type of thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Was this before or after the president's effigy was standing right. on Wall Street? Do you remember there was this mock-up? At Wall Street? It was in Madison Square, wasn't it? The, 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 the naked statue of Trump. Oh, no, this was before Trump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I thought maybe they were oh, you mean in Union Square, the, the big, yeah, yeah. That was recently, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, oh, here we go. I want to say thank you. Um, Can you talk more into the mic, please? Or oh, like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, th thank you. I have really enjoyed this panel. Um, right now I'm in shock. Um, Rob, I've never saw you speak before. Keep on <laughs> telling that story because uh, in third grade, that's when integration came about for me. And um, we didn't talk about black history in school, but we talked about Mississippi history in um, American history. So um, I'd like to story about the Jim Crow, can remember all of that. Uh, you go girl, because when I saw you, I said, that's a powerful black woman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> to take your clothes off, I'm mean, asking, she's going places. <laughs> and you, I, thank you, you know, because like I said, I've lived in the South all of my life, and um, the only way I found out about black history is me, from my family, in me reading on my own, you know, so. And I will say, go into schools, come to Mississippi, because in our schools you don't hear that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a woman with a disability. I didn't have any images. There are a lot of black girls who would love to see you. And let's hope they don't take their clothes off right now. <laughs> no, I don't but, advise everybody but, to do that. But <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. I, I mean, I, I have truly been moved. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. If you don't know, Roz Roy is an incredible local artist here in Jackson. Some of my favorite pieces in my home are by Roz. Oh. And I would uh, say two things that she said that I think are particularly important. Um, when I asked again about what we can do, mm -hmm. um, we got to get beyond doing this in these circles. I think here we're preaching to the choir. <laughs> Uh, we have to get out in our communities. We have to get it out in our schools. We have to make sure our kids know this history. Um, we have to, as scholars, get out of our ivory towers and actually get our, our feet on the ground and do the work in our communities. I think that's particularly important. Uh, and also, I would uh, add here, when we're understanding this history, let's do understand that it is continuous that today we are deeply impacted by that history, and it's not as if it just happened. Roz mentioned desegregation in Mississippi. Of course, Brown versus the Board of Education was 1954. Desegregation doesn't come until 1970. And in Mississippi and in Jackson alone, 10,000 white students in 1970 left JPS, Jackson Public Schools alone. That was 40% of the student body population. 60% of them ended up in segregationist academies, including a young man who transferred to a school called Council McClure, created by the Citizens Council, the largest private segregationist organization in the nation. And his name is Phil Bryant, our governor of the state of Mississippi.
and, and, and also as parents, you know, the greatest thing you can do is advocate um, in your schools to the way that American history is being taught, and specifically slavery. And I, be I believe that it is there that we can uh, begin to this healing process if we accurately um, teach how slavery actually occurred. Wow. And that's a, that's a big issue too that's, that's being um, pushed about uh, the way that slavery is being taught is so grossly inaccurate that it's, 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 not, it's not doing anything. And so I think you have, we have to begin as parents to um, push for that. Right, we have to compel the schools to do this. I actually read something that was saying um, I read this, I guess, last fall, and it said that um, schools in Mississippi, public schools, weren't really teaching civil rights history. And I, I mean, I just find that, you know, it's Amazing. insane, right? Yeah. And you, here in Mississippi, they're not teaching a, civil rights a, history. a whole other story. We actually, by state law, have a mandate that civil rights education be taught in all social studies classes, kindergarten through 12th grade. But when the legislature enacted that law, they enacted no enforcement mechanism. So there's no testing of it and there's no penalty for not teaching it. So unless it's incumbent upon mm -hmm. teachers and principals and administrators and those of us who are parents and other folks in the community to demand that our schools teach these. Yeah. It's uh, interesting because the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center did a study of the uh, curriculum across the country to uh, rate how they teach civil rights history and uh, Alabama, New York, and Florida got C's. Every other state in the country got a D or an F. Um, and that's uh, surprising in a certain way, but, but maybe not given the kind of history of Alabama. My name's Theo Foster. Thank you very much for this excellent panel. Apologize for walking in late, um, but I just want to invite us to think through uh, some uh, uh, the thinking of a black studies scholar named Christina Sharp that your work, Nona, makes me think about uh, in particular. Um, um, that also helps us think through the kind of conundrum with these monuments. She makes a distinction between monumental time and ship time, trying to think through the wake of the slave ship and what work that does for help us to think through the kind of continuity of this trauma that your work does differently than uh, a kind of Confederate monument, which freezes history in a certain way, or even uh, some of the work that I study in Alabama, the kind of work of Edmund Pettus Bridge is a certain kind of monument that freezes a certain kind of political moment versus uh, other kinds of artwork or, or performative work that helps us to understand how we are still living in the wake of not only uh, racial slavery, but also uh, the trauma of civil rights that uh, occurred here and ongoing with Charleston and whatnot. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much for uh, uh, this panel and your work. You're welcome. Thank you. I might um, say that in, in, in thinking about the, the uh, magnitude of this issue, that most people who teach in schools, uh, or not very young people, uh, got the New South version of right. the Civil War, and that includes me, who, who went to school in the Hudson Valley in New York. Uh, it was st that was still the, uh, uh, the New South version of the Civil War and, and Reconstruction. The National Park Service still uh, tells in many places essentially the southern view of the Civil War. The Abraham Lincoln Museum in Springfield, Missouri gives you the southern version of the Civil War. Um, so, uh, just to reinforce the point that's been made several times, particularly by Nona, is that it's not just a southern issue, that this kind of re-education uh, is a national re-education. We look at things like Charlottesville, most of those people weren't from the south, and reverence for the Confederacy is just a small part uh, of that kind of white supremacist movement. Um, I would suspect that many of those people who were there in Charlottesville only had a vague notion of Robert, who Robert E. Lee was, and that many couldn't spell it. <laughs> but uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's the, so, so when we're talking about the monuments and so on, uh, we're talking about a small piece of a much bigger picture that we have to understand. I like what you said in a, an article that was published recently with a, on a blog where you was talked about this isn't really about monuments, it's about values. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. what really this is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, I'm from Macomb, Mississippi, uh, home of the Berglund walkout, Brenda Travis, uh, bombing capital of the world, actually. 
And we have a Confederate monument in front of City Hall. And the Afri an African American councilman has suggested moving it to a private cemetery. And I'm wondering, is that just a compromise or a way to uh, sort of sell out? <clears throat> I, you know, I'm still, I'm still uh, trying to, myself to, uh, to comprehend uh, about what do we do with these statues. I mean, yeah, initially, like deep inside, yeah, I just want to melt them down and disappear. But, you know, um, I, 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 if you have to keep them, is moving it to a cemetery um, a good option? There, there's something that seems metaphorically appropriate about trying to bury it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, you know, okay, it, beside the Civil War monuments, but there's even the, the issue about our presidents, the presidents who, who owned slaves like Washington and Jefferson. And, I, you know, someone said, well, well, do those go as well? You know, so like in New York, we have Washington outside the federal federal building, um, and I, I I say you know, part of his legacy and history is still not being taught that he was a notorious slave owner who hunted his slaves to the end who, who when they ran away. So I, I I want I want that kind of incorporated into his legacy, you know. Um, and, 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 and put that on plaques. If you want to keep the statue up, tell the truth. So what about this, I mean, this contextualization kind of thing? I know, um, Del, you've, you've talked about this and written about it. Can, is it possible to really do that? Can we actually amend those um, monuments and let them stay in space, but we've added something to them? Um, I don't think we can. Uh, as someone who works with material culture and visual things, I think the visual image is more powerful than words. That if you took a statue of Robert E. Lee on a horse looking very majestic, and you put a little label on so that he was really a nasty guy, <laughs> when you go away, what will remain in your mind is a, a majestic guy on a horse. Uh, so that's an issue, I think. Uh, another issue when people talk about, well, leave them in place but contextualize them, is this um, issue that I mentioned earlier of civic space. Civic space is a context. It says that uh, we as a group uh, want to commemorate, honor this. So uh, on the one hand, it seems to me that uh, th there's, there's also the, the issue of free speech, which is brought up about leaving the monuments in place, really, uh, it seems to me, is more appropriate if you think about where they are. If you want a Confederate monument in your backyard, you have that right to do it. Um, in fact, the, the UDC in Tallahassee preemptively took down the Confederate monument from the courthouse and moved it to their place. But uh, if, if you're going to contextualize it, th th uh, this is a, a suggestion that I've made and, 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 and not really in jest. If you want to con leave that statue there, then the way to contextualize it is to let local African-American people who are descendants of the people who lived there when it went up, since they had no say in it going up, let them contextualize it. Let them do whatever they want to it. And with no, uh, one of the problems that comes up with monuments is that, is frankly, that white people always feel like they have to have the last word, even in African-American monuments. Just say, okay, you guys do whatever you want. You want to put text on it, you want to spray paint it, you want to do whatever you want you contextualize this monument. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, it should go. I, what, uh, I, I, I've often thought that particularly with the common soldier monuments, what you should do is do something, you all know the, the uh, ceramic warriors in China. Take, go someplace like the new reconstruction national park in South Carolina, just take these things and line them up rows and rows and rows and just that that uh, the no sheer numbers of them would, ha would have a metaphorical power that uh, uh, I think would, would, be, would make it worth doing. And that would lend itself to the burial. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Hold on a moment. I appreciate the new definition of what monuments are, and I appreciate the bravery of kind of a saying that slaves were involved in the making of Wall Street and other parts of the city. And, and, but I wanted to respond to, to Mr. Luckett's point about the, um, the dialogue that's necessary. In Hattiesburg, I teach at USM, I teach human rights, and I'm the director of the Center for Human Rights. Um, by the way, we're looking for donors so we can do stuff like this down there too. Um, but what, what, what strikes me was two things. One, when I first started teaching civil rights history in my political science courses, students got a little angry and I said, well, are you angry at me? And they said, no, we're angry at our secondary school teachers who are not teaching this. And that continues. Uh, but in terms of dialogue, there was a moment that was a bit unusual. We've had a, um, a sort of a pro-Confederate flag group standing in front of our university for more than two years, every Sunday including a former faculty member. And one day, while they were shouting at each other because the police moved them inside the campus off the street, because they get run over, uh, and they were having dialogue and shouting at each other with megaphones at a distance of about 40 feet with police in the middle. It was peaceful. But at one point, one side recognized that the other guy speaking back and forth, they were both veterans. And they just stopped for a minute. And they said, well, come out to the front and let's shake hands. And they did, and they embraced each other. So I think dialogue is possible um, without insulting people, um, but just talking about what did happen. So I appreciate this panel as, as a step forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I would simply say, and it, this makes me think of something that Dell said, the uh, white supremacists are very fragile. <laughs> uh, and it's hard to have that dialogue, but I think you're right that it is possible and it's essential. Uh, and I'm particularly lucky in that I get to teach at Jackson State that's 92% African American, and so my students are ready to have this dialogue and ready to engage it. They haven't been taught this history. I mean, I grew up in Mississippi. I know for a fact in my Mississippi history class, Medgar Evers and Fannie Lou Hamer were never mentioned in a, in a Mississippi history class in the early 90s, right? Um, but having this dialogue is absolutely essential, but also difficult, especially in places like Mississippi, because we frequently find ourselves in groups like this one, where we are talking with people who all agree with us. Right. And that's the hard part to figure out. Yeah. Yes, um, I'm an English teacher, I teach 11th grade English. And I can truly say that I teach in a school that is probably about 48% black, 51% white, and you have 2% that are other. And I am one of four African Americans on staff. We have about 1,800 students and about 125 faculty. So when students walk into my English class and I began to just make discussions and I always try to link history with English, they walk hand in hand. What happens culturally and civically affects what is written and how it is said and how it is presented. So when we get to the Harlem Renaissance and they say, well, I know about Langston Hughes. They had to memorize something in African-American history during February when they were in sixth grade and that's all they know. So they never heard of Zora Neale or County Cullen or anyone else, Claude McKay. So it's an awakening to them. And when they read the literature, it's an awakening. And so when I start teaching about um, lynching and they read, uh, we play the song, um, Strange Fruit. Strange Fruit, I had a brain freeze. But I get questions, you know, like, is this real? When they see the images, they're asking me if it's real. Like I'm pulling their leg, like it's a fantastic joke. But I have to have that moment with them that these children are coming to me and they are, just defunct yeah. of who they are. Right. Um, and it's sad. It's, it's not being taught in schools, any of it, any of it. I have a little girl who's nine years old. And, you know, even as parents, we're all in our, in our own world. We're working, we're trying to make a living. And, and sometimes we, we miss out on things. We miss things, steps we can take. And so one of the, the things I did, you know, is I'm teaching myself still. I'm teaching myself. Um, but what I did was I collected all the books I could find on 
my thing is black women, right? My love of black women in history. So I found all these books that I could for her and gave them to her uh, for Christmas. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, um, all, all these women, the, the, um, Coretta Scott King, um, you, all these women in history that did something incredible. Um, from chefs to dancers, Josephine Baker, all of them, um, as, as many as I could find, uh, Marian Anderson. Um, and and that's, that's the way we can begin at home. If, even if our schools aren't doing it, you know, as parents, we have the responsibility I, to do it. And with that in mind, I have that question. Um, your imagery of a woman, a black woman, is a powerful statement to me but how can we better change how black women are viewed? Because when you hear the word powerful black woman, mm -hmm. to me and to you it means something. But in, in how we are dealt with publicly, especially with like, you know, how Michelle Obama has been visualized. Powerful is a double-edged sword. Uh, zealous is a very bad word. Um, aggressive are the words and terminologies used to conceptualize yeah. black women. How do you think images like this will change? I don't, I don't know if, if, you know, images can change the, the absolute perception. I mean, I hope to, I hope it does. That's why I, 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 I'm a photographer because I believe in the power of images. Um, but it has to be something more. I mean, we have to want to change um, and change the conversation. Um, but I don't know, it's, I also grappled with a lot of that. Uh, the word powerful, you know, um, being bo too bossy, perceived as being the angry black woman, you know, all of that. Uh, I, I, in the end, I didn't care, you know, I, how you perceive what I'm doing and who I am. I, ha I have to be true to me, and I think we also, all of us have to be true to, to ourselves in, 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 in that context. Um, you, have to, you have to be honest, um, and, and hopefully, I, I still have a lot of hope that we can change the conversation and the narrative around that. Um, just being who we are, you know, as, as women, as black women. Um, we, we're seeing a lot of influence, you know, um, in that context. I don't know, it's, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's really hard, but um, all we can do is just keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Thank you. This has been a great panel. Um, I have some points coming kind of from my background as, let's say, uh, I'm a, a sculptor, so I'm interested in the material art and material culture, um, and you know, an embedded Southerner. And one of the issues that is coming up with the issue of removing these monuments in a lot of Southern communities is the fact that the communities <laughs> might want to remove the statues but the state legislatures have laws on the books that don't allow the cities to do this. So it's kind of how do you get out of the white box and into the larger realm of the, the state and to the more rural areas where they keep electing officials who are trying, in Alabama last year, they actually passed a law that would remove states or cities from removing monuments. So there's this you know, strong counterforce coming you know, that's at play right now. In Memphis recently, they moved a monument, and the way that the city of Memphis made that work was they actually, the city gave the land that the monument was on to a private entity. And since that land was no longer public land, the private entity was able, that became a park. They were able to remove the monument, which is clever, but that's also happening in Gadsden, Alabama in the past year. The city of Gadsden did the same thing. They were being challenged for a cross that was on the public courthouse ground. And so they gave it to the property next door so they could the cross could still be right over the courthouse, but it would be on pro private property, so it was not you know, legally challengeable, although it is being challenged. So I think, in a way, you can you know, expand, and you've started talking about this to some degree. It's not just white supremacy. 
you're seeing um, you know, a certain kind of, uh, some people who claim Christianity and want to impose it in kind of a hegemonic way. So there is this larger issue and the, the, the people who are struggling over these issues are kind of using similar strategies. And I'm thinking in terms of like working with our legislatures since we do have such gerrymandered uh, you know, legislatures where you, there is, uh, and in many cases, smaller, more rural populations have greater have greater control over what's going on with public policy and civic space in our cities where we want to have these changes. Um, I'm kind of curious about how we can get out of the museum too and go have those conversations in areas that maybe don't have arts programming or aren't coming out today to do this. And a completely unrelated question, could you explain the white shoes? Because we haven't talked about the symbolism of them. Um, um, Nona, if you could get to that quick, okay, that'd okay, be awesome. Because we do have to wrap up pretty uh, soon. The white shoes are symbolic of white supremacy and whiteness on the black body. That was, that's one, just one aspect of it. Yeah. I think the, the question you raised about how, you know, basically I think it was about how can we um, apply this, right, the, and get this knowledge out there. I think that's a question for all of us. And I actually was planning to pose a question similar to that for all of you in the audience. Like, how can you apply what we've been discussing here in this panel? How can you apply this to your life? Like, what can you do to be applying this discussion to your community? And um, I think, you know, as you were saying, applying this to, um, you know, thinking about this, these state laws and city laws and things like that, all of this needs to go out there. You know, we were talking about the schools and such. Um, how can we actually all make a change um, in our lives? So that's the question I'm posing to all of you. And I'm just wrapping up because we have to kind of move on to lunchtime. And I do invite you to, you know, continue talking to panelists if you can grab them. Because um, I know this can just go on and we all need to do this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.